Hey guys, Young Blood with you for the 62nd episode of the Inbox. And if you're noticing a little bit of extra echo in this video and a couple of my more recent ones, that's because my office is now currently set up in the middle of my unfinished basement. The reason it's like that is because I'm finishing off my office, so I will have drywall and carpet and a ceiling and everything. So the echo should be gone within a couple weeks once I get that completed. So in the meantime, I'm going to do my best to kind of mitigate the uh, echo, but no promises. It's going to be at least a little present for the next week or so. So let's go ahead and start off with a question from Devin Spangler. Say has a SDL, what would be a good compliment for the Drake Herald within a $200 budget? Um, it's kind of a vague question. You know, if you're talking about like an escort for the uh, ship, you know, something that would maybe be helpful to determine when threats are inbound would be something that would be probably helpful. You know, it's something that's kind of combat capable as well. You know, so maybe like a Hornet tracker, you know, you've got a, a good uh, set of sensors on it. You're able to see threats from a long way off. It's got a better combat capability probably than the Drake Herald. Um, you know, I, I think that would probably be kind of natural. You know, a freelancer Durr might be okay. Um, you know, an Anvil Terrapin would probably be okay. Um, but you probably want something that is basically either really good at seeing threats or really good at uh, dealing with them when they come up. Now, you need to keep in mind that Drake Herald's going to be really, really fast. So if that ship is turning and running, you don't necessarily want to leave your other one in the dust unless it's able to actually compete. Um, you know, at that $200 budget, you know, I, you've got a bunch of different options. Um, you know, if you're really just looking for what the Drake Herald does, which is carry information or steal information or do like electronic warfare, um, then I think those ones that I just mentioned are probably your best bets. Uh, Tom N says, question for the next one, what is the biggest obstacle to the final release of the game? Um, there's probably a few. Uh, I think one of them that they're trying to figure out right now is primarily going to be like the networking of everything. Um, you know, trying to get the performance down, trying to get the item system in place, trying to get the object containers working as they're supposed to, um, being able to streamline and have a bunch of uh, people in the same you know area and not seeing performance drop as a result. Uh, I think AI is a big part of it, and some of that's going to be design. You know, the mission giving system. I don't think there's one just biggest obstacle that's in place. I think it's going to be more about. Um, you know, Father Time being the biggest obstacle right now. It's they're they're trying to accomplish something that's never really been done, uh, and that takes more time than they expect. So their obstacle is really meeting our expectations of getting the game out in a reasonable amount of time, but getting it done in a way that's actually you know feasible, playable, uh, and you know up to their standards of what it's supposed to be. Uh, Dan McSharp says, now that everybody and their mom just got the chance to get a discounted Mighty Super Hornet, do you think there's a chance they'll nerf it so that the combat capabilities of every other ship in the game starts to matter, or is it just going to get worse with the new slower flight mechanics? Um, it is slower. It's a little bit less maneuverable now that we're in 6.1 or 2.6.1. Um, that being said, the price on the Super Hornet actually increased. Um, you know, it's now a $180 ship. So even though people were able to get it with cash, the overall value of the ship is now higher. Um, I don't think they're going to nerf it. I think it's a ship that they want to continue to have be very powerful. It's a very Hornet-centric game. Um, I mean, right now you can probably be better off in the current release at a Super Hornet than something like a Vanguard, which is a heavier fighter. So I don't see any situation where it actually gets nerfed. I think it's kind of the gold standard as far as brawlers are concerned, and that's probably going to continue to be that. Now, there's going to be some balancing and tweaking as far as the speeds and agility, not only of that ship, but everything else that it might be engaging. Um, and then one thing we don't have in place today is range. Um, the Hornet line is known to be kind of a shorter range carrier based fighter. Now it obviously has a quantum drive, it can go on its own, but it's not going to be a long range ship. So in something like Arena Commander or in something like Persistent Universe within just the one system that we have right now, there, there's not, you know, these long distance travel. So as far as, you know, it, where you're balancing the ship against, it's kind of in its wheelhouse at the moment. The question is going to be once we get to the point to where we're jumping across systems and where we're jumping to different locations, you know, what impact does range play on the ship? Um, Real Arc says, STL, what's your favorite planet and why? Um, there's probably two that stand out to me um, in the Osiris system, uh, Osiris 1, uh, Edos. Um, that's the one that actually has the Fares Apes. Um, you know, it's kind of a, a fledgling, uh, I don't know, species. Um, you know, it's known to, they're known to be kind of hunted by pirates, and actually uh, they end up making a mug out of the skull. Um, it's illegal to do that sort of thing. There's even a space station there that's trying to provide protection for the, that species. Um, so I think going there and kind of seeing what all of that's about is pretty interesting to me. Um, the other one would be in the Null system, Null 5, uh, Ashana, uh, is the uh, planet where there's a crashed uh, Bengal carrier that's kind of been turned into a black market and a... Uh, 
um, you know, just kind of a thriving community of its own. So for me, I think those two are kind of uh, going to be really interesting places to go visit. Um, and they're going to be really interesting places as far as lore and what the communities are like, and just kind of theoretically interesting as well. Um, one that's not really a planet, uh, but should be a really cool location to go see is a spider. Uh, you know, it's basically a, I don't know, a, a, a mashup of a bunch of different ships and stations to kind of create this real hodgepodge of a location that's kind of a black market and, uh, you know, like a pirate safe haven. I think going and seeing something like that is going to be really visually pretty impressive and something I'm looking forward to. Uh, Lantern Nick says, what are your predictions on how powerful the Carrick will be? Consider this, it's meant to be a one-stop shop for exploration. I'm not thinking that you won't want escorts, but as an exploration ship, it has to be durable, right? Combat capable? What if you jump into a Vandal heavy system? You need to be able to fight in it. What about more durable shields and seals to help against harmful gas clouds, etc.? Um, well, the ship is going to be relatively powerful in an exploration role. You know, it's got um, powerful scanners. It's got a med bay on board. It's got an engineering bay. Uh, you know, it's got the runabout. It's got, um, you know, jump point scanning. It's got a whole lot of features that make it a really capable explorer. You know, it kind of is the pinnacle of exploration ships. Um, you know, as far as durability goes, it's an anvil ship. We know that it's actually got the uh, retractable canopy to go over the... Uh, the uh, cockpit area um, or the bridge area so I think that's something that kind of alludes to the fact that it should be able to do a little bit more uh, as far as like dangerous exploration now and while it is relatively heavily armed I mean jumping into a vandal system without sufficient escorts is going to be a really bad idea you know your exploration should probably be catered towards going to what we don't know or to the unknown. Most of the Vandal areas we actually know about because we you know, I either used to own them, um, we used to have them, or we've at least been there before the threat really expanded. So, I mean, I haven't seen anything specific about, um, you know, seals against harmful gas clouds, but, I mean, it's got a big power plant, it's got good shielding on it, it's got good armor. So, I mean, compared to some of the other explorers, it should be able to probably do pretty well in harmful situations, but we do know that corrosive surfaces exist in the game, and nothing is going to be completely immune to them. So I think against heat, it'll probably be pretty. It'll be probably pretty strong. It's probably going to be able to see through harmful gas clouds better than others. Um, but I'm not necessarily looking at it and saying that this thing is going to be, you know, some super durable ship that's going to be able to kind of handle any situation. You're still going to need to be really careful at how you deploy the ship because you know it. it it's not an, an invulnerable. Otherwise, it would become a combat ship, and it's not meant to be that. Uh, Jeff Hardy says, "Young boy, loving your content. Thank you." Uh, question, will we be able to trade out man turrets for auto turrets also and on that same vein? I noticed the luxury version of the Connie, there is an auto point defense system that can be added to any Connie, or more importantly, the Carrick. Um, please note, I understand that man turrets are a part of the team play, but haven't set, uh, set in one. Uh, wasn't practical or overly fun. Some sort of manning weapons council system mate. Okay, so basically, would you be able to put it on auto turrets on ships? Um, yes, uh, CIG's talked about that. Roberts has talked about that. There's probably going to be some penalty for swapping out the man for the actual machine, but we've also seen that there's just computers that you can install that don't necessarily impact the size. So, you know, it just comes down to the price of what you're willing to pay to have it installed, and that's going to have a direct correlation to the quality of what's going to be done. Um, I was always under the impression, or at least earlier on, that we were going to see, um, you know, like a different type of turret that's actually installed, and then that auto turret then becomes something that's either slave to your computer, you know, your main targeting system, or it ends up becoming something that you control remotely. Um, and that was probably going to be a reduction in size. Now it seems like it's just going to be like a computer module add-on that's going to impact how that actually works. And it sounds like you might be able to just add that into your component system. Then it ends up becoming either an auto turret or a, you know, a remote turret. And then you can also have somebody jump into it later if you want to. Um, it's almost like an alternative to an NPC in a way. So I, I don't really know what the flexibility is going to be there. I mean, we've got a little bit of conflicting information. We've got a little bit of new information and old information kind of butting heads just a little bit. Um, so I think we're going to get a lot more information on that soon, but um, I think that something that based on what you're looking at is going to be coming. Now a point defense system is going to be interesting because um, theoretically a hard point could be a hard point. It should go just about anywhere, but there are different classes and a point defense system is technically a different class of weapon than a typical hard point. So I don't think you're necessarily going to be able to yank a point defense system off of a Phoenix and put it on like an Andromeda. I think it's a totally different hard point. Um, you know, so I, that one's going to kind of be a wait and see because we don't know. 
We know there's different classes, but we don't know what upgrades you could make to those hard points to change out that class. You know, there's going to be some obvious restrictions. Like, you're not going to be able to take off a turret and put on, like, a, a capital ship anti, you know, an ASA turret. You know, there's going to be some restrictions based on size, power draw, um, the, the fittings, and those types of things. So, theoretically, I think you're going to have the ability to add point defense systems to other ships, but I think it's going to be a little bit more limited than what you probably would think as far as just plug and play. And our last two questions today are from patrons, uh, starting off with Sketchy. Uh, how many passengers do you think transport ships like uh, the Phoenix or 890 Jump will be able to accommodate? Uh, it's a good question. Um, I think one that we need kind of some more information about because you, technically you could cram as many people on a ship as you want, fly around, and as long as you're not in like heavy turbulence or getting engaged, you know, they're probably not going to get tossed around too bad. So the number of seats probably has an impact on how many people you can technically take in a safe situation. Um, that being said, that probably doesn't really become a huge issue in, unless you're in combat or maybe in atmosphere. Um, I think what we're probably going to be seeing is more restrictions based on like life support. You know, like a freelancer is a good example. It technically carries like three to four crew, but in the back, you could probably pile in 20 to 30 people. You know, I doubt the life support system on a freelancer is designed to be able to support that many people. So I think you're probably going to see something like the Phoenix is capable of carrying maybe like eight people and the 890 Jump is maybe capable of carrying like 20 people. Um, you know, something like that. You know, while there's obviously more space and you can technically cram more bodies onto the ship, I don't think you're necessarily going to be able to be proficient, um, you know, in hauling them around because there's going to be some sort of in-game restriction, I would think. Uh, and the last question is from Rockseeker. Do we have any information on how CIG intends to implement or differentiate between lower high security areas? Um, some of it's just going to be based on what you know. You know, if you head out to the edge of a solar system, you're probably going to get to a situation to where um, it's probably lower security. It's probably going to be um, higher crime rates because you're further away from the core where most of the civilization is. Um, you know, as far as just overall star systems, you're probably going to have that tied to your Moby glass. Um, everything has a reputation. You know, I think people are going to have a reputation. Ships might even have a reputation. Systems have reputations. Um, and it, I think if you do your research, you're going to be able to know pretty well. Um, I would expect there to probably be some sort of rating, um, you know, like in whether that be numerical or whether that be by title, you know, maybe it's low, medium, high, or maybe it's one through 10 or something like that. Um, there's probably going to be something you can look at in your Moby glass to actually say, okay, this is a dangerous area. It's showing it to me this way. I don't think you're going to have to just inherently know that, you know, like Cathcart might be a dangerous location to go, but Terra is a pretty safe one. I think you are going to get to a point where you just know that from traveling around, um, but things can change. Um, so it's never going to always be the same. Um, and you're going to see, um, you know, probably something in game that's going to give you that information. So that's it for this episode of The Inbox. If you guys have questions, get them in. Otherwise, thanks for watching. Have yourselves a wonderful day, and take care.